Hello and welcome to the Fitzgerald Family Farm here in Port Law in County Waterford. Chagas Glombia and the European Milk Forum are bringing you a live webinar from the farm today. And the main focus of this webinar is how the Fitzgerald Family Farm are reducing their carbon footprint. I'm here on behalf of the European Milk Forum to talk about an EU funded project on dairy sustainability where six countries are working together to communicate what's being done to make dairy sustainable in the longer term. Grass is the key differentiator here in Ireland. The rain falls, the grass grows, and it is the key component of the cow's diet. Particularly on this farm, you're going to see evidence of biodiversity, grass growth, soil management, fertilizer management, which provides a unique high quality product on behalf of Irish dairy. The Fitzgerald Farm here in Portlaw County Waterford are part of the joint programme between Glanby and Chagas. Our open source future farm programme is designed to disseminate information to our wider supply base. We believe in Glanby that the best way for farmers to learn is to learn from other farmers. The importance of sustainability to Glanby is that we improve the social sustainability, economic sustainability and environmental sustainability of all our farms in the Glanby area. Hi, my name is Shane Fitzgerald. Welcome to our family farm in Port Law County, Waterford. I'm the third generation farming this land. We're milking 210 cows and 90 hectares. The main focus of today is to show how we are reducing our carbon footprint, but also maintaining high performance and high profitability in our herd. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Fitzgerald Farm here in Port Law in County Waterford. We have an action packed programme here today and we have a great panel of speakers. And firstly I just want to thank Chagas Glambia and NDC with, in conjunction with the European Milk Forum for uh, organising today with us. Um, today really is about Shane Fitzgerald's farm. Shane is part of the Future Farm programme with Chagas and Glambia. It's about how Shane is reducing his carbon footprint for the farm. As I said, we have a great panel of speakers and I'm just going to introduce the panel here first of all. Shane Fitzgerald and the Fitzgerald family, I'd like to thank them for taking us on. So Shane, thanks for joining us today. We have Brendan Horn from Moor Park, uh, Research Officer in Moor Park. Thanks for joining us, um, Brendan. And Shane McElroy from Glombie, Ireland. So we have different sections and we'll explain that as we go down through the day. Uh, this morning. So first to you Shane, you're a late starter to farming. You yeah. got a lot from the earlier video but maybe just go through your how you got into this farming crack. I was Richie, I suppose I took the, the scenic route I suppose you could say when I finished school in 2009. I suppose things weren't looking great and uh, I suppose the dairy front, um, milk price was low, it was a bad year weather wise so as my mother advised me at the time she said go for a, a backup of plan B just in case things didn't work out. So that's when I decided to go to WIT and I'd done a four year course there in business studies and I streamed into accountancy. And I suppose as part of that then I got to do some travelling. So I got to go to Canada in 2012 for six months on the scholarship programme and then I got to go on a J1 to, to Montauk in America. So that was just out for a few, the session and the, the few points, nothing to do with farming whatsoever, but sure. That's important. It, yeah, no, that's, it is part of why I always advise young farmers to do that, just to get away from the farm. Um, no matter what you're doing, just to broaden your horizons, to become more independent. Um, and I was writing, to, like, I, grew, I grew as a person through that. And then I suppose I went back to Kildalton after that then, and I'd done the level six dairy herd management. So I got to go to New Zealand as part of that. So I learned all that side of things, all about grass measuring, all about the business side of things. Again, it was a, a chance to travel to get away. I suppose my father was probably worried at times, would I ever come back? Maybe I was after doing so much traveling, but um, I, I enjoyed it. And I came back more focused and motivated. I was 26 and I came back to the farm full time then, even though I was always working there when I was younger, like to you know. Um, I was always living at home. I was always doing weekends and evenings, but I suppose, um, look, it was, it was the right time. He was, he was 62 at the time. He was ready to kind of take a step back and the transition was, was better as a result. So like, um, yeah, no, it was, it, was the, it was the best thing I'd done, like I know. I have the education behind me and that's after, after standing to me now as well. And you're farming in partnership with your father? Yeah, the two of us are here full time so and I suppose we'd have, we'd have help as well in the, from students in the springtime. My girlfriend Kate helps out as well, she loves milking, all the family help out. Yeah, my sister. Yeah, no, she, she loves the cows and she 
sister has out of sight this time and yeah. crossing the cows in the road, the whole family's involved, so it's, um, yeah, it's lovely. And nowadays, how do you keep yourself informed? You're involved in a lot of discussion groups and other organisations. How do you? Yeah, sure, I'm, like, I'm, I'm the chairman of my own discussion group. I'm the chairman of my local MACRA club, Kilmac, I'm the chair of the Ag Affairs. So look, I'm, get, I'm involved as much as I can with anything. I'm always like, I'm, I'm trying to be an ambassador and a leader in, in what I do, because like, I'm passionate about that. So I'm, I suppose in my role as Ag Affairs, I'm always trying to get, I suppose, our voice is heard for young farmers, like, you know, on the ground. Um, so like recently, we've been lobbying TDs and politicians and all matters. Um, for young farmers, whether it's, it's tax, relief, tax reliefs, um, anything in relation to environmental schemes, because we are the young farmers, we're the, we're the ones who are going to adapt to change and we're the ones who are going to, to likely to, we're going to be the future, obviously, so it's important that we have our, our voices heard. Okay, thanks for that, Shane, and, and we have two Shanes here today, so we'll get a bit confused. So, Shane, Shane McElroy, Shane, we've worked together, Chagas and Glambi, in loads of programmes the last 25 years, yeah. we've had joint programmes. This programme is slightly different. Uh, than the previous programmes, maybe. Absolutely, and it's different, Richie, and yet it's the same. It's, it's, it's working on the adoption of best practice and, 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 and you know, a testament to the programme is people like Shane joining the programme, you know, multi-generational family farms, real expertise here on the farm, and we we'll go through it over the next hour, how much is happening here on the farm. But it's all about farm efficiency, reducing the carbon footprint, pushing on the sustainability of the farms, and profitability linked to that as well. And we'll go through the different areas and how that all it blends in together. So I, I suppose, as well as covering the basics in this programme, so you have the basics of the soil, the grass, and the breeding management, with the focus on sustainability as well, with biodiversity and reducing the carbon footprint, which is, you know, from a regulatory point of view, from a customer point of view, from a profitability and efficiency on the farm point of view, absolutely key. So th the farmers, the 11 farmers, this is a, a five-year programme and the 11 farmers over that duration are taking part in many uh, uh, programmes and initiatives, so they're recording grass obviously through pasture base, taking part in a, a number of initiatives that Glambia have available as well, so Great Grass, the Herd Disease Screening Programme, the Milk Culturing Programme, um, you know, there's the ASAP programme as well, which we'll mention later on, and then Farm Gen as well, and Shane, right above us here, we've got the solar panels on the, the roof of the shed where Shane has uh, installed the, the Farm Gen. So again, just to thank Shane for hosting us here today on the farm and for being part of the programme and to all the 11 monitor farmers as well, and the, the real value that that brings into the wider Lambia uh, farmer population as well. I think the, the opening point, Shane, that you mentioned there, it starts with the basics. Absolutely. We need to get the basics right. Absolutely. With, without having the soil right to grow the grass, the cow right to take that grass and produce uh, as efficiently as possible the best quality milk, you know, th all the, the grass-based piece, the family farm piece, the, the low carbon footprint, it all really resonates with our customers in the marketplace. And we are totally unique, and we'll talk about it lots today, but you know, we're really unique in, in world production of dairy. So we need to play, our, play to our strengths. And that's what we show from Absolutely. Shane's farm here today, Absolutely. Shane Fitzgerald's farm here today. Brendan, you know, why, like why is dairy sustainability so important? to Irish farmers and to the consumer, the marketplace? Yeah, so we're food producers. Whether you're a farmer working in research or any part of the supply chain, we're producing food, but we're about meeting customer expectations. And it's clear what customers want now, Richie. They want high quality, low emissions foods. Okay, that's the, the key requirement now. And I suppose what Shane's doing on this farm, grassland, 100% grassland farm, He's effortlessly meeting those expectations in terms of, you know, whether it's animal performance, animal welfare, animals out grazing, sequestering carbon, building biodiversity. Those things are easily achieved on a grassland farm. And I suppose it's producing those high quality products that are now really desired in the marketplace. So that's why it's, and I suppose the big challenge for us is to, is to explain to our customers all the attributes of these systems and, and, and how they produce the quality of product that they, that they require. Okay, lads, that's... Just a brief introduction to it, and we're going to have, we have four different sections. We have grass, we have biodiversity, then we're going to talk about the cow's influence on carbon, and then we're going to talk about water quality. Uh, so just to introduce the first section here on grass, a couple of days ago we, had a we created a video here where Shane brought us through his grassland management on the farm. We are doing several things on the farm to reduce nitrogen usage. Firstly, the main foundation is to get good soil fertility on the farm. We're trying to increase our pH, spreading lime every year, and we also have been building our P's and K's over the last number of years. We receive 10% of the farm every year. We incorporate clover into the mix. 
We try to cut down our nitrogen usage towards the spring and the autumn time by using low emission slurry spreading on half the farm and protected urea on the other half of the farm. We've grown 11 tonnes of grass up until the middle of August and we aim to grow over 14 tonnes of grass for this year. I'm doing grass measuring here throughout the year, weekly and twice weekly in the high growing season. It allows me to know what the grass requirements are from a nutrient point of view so we can come up with a fertiliser plan and we can match that to our grass growth and we can match our stocking rate to the grass growth. So we're targeting to grow 14 tonnes per hectare this year, so our stocking rate is 2.5 per hectare, which is sustainable and efficient. OK, you just after watching that video, I think you would agree there was an awful amount of information that Shane gave in that one minute, and we're going to discuss that through uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes. But there is a questions and answer session that you as the audience can type in uh, questions and answers and our question and Siobhan Cavanagh, Regional Manager for Kilkenny Warford, will uh, give us those questions. So please interact with us, type in those questions uh, online and we'll take them in, in onto the panel here. So first of all, after that grass, I'm going to turn straight away. You know, grass strikes me, Brendan, straight away is why is it so important? What's so different about grass here and other systems? Why is much, yeah. That much better. Sure. So, Shane, a 100% grass-based system. In Europe, only about 30% of the agriculture area is grassland. I suppose that allows Shane to produce product of high quality with low emissions. In terms of producing product on this farm, you're talking about producing product of one kilo of milk per ki or CO2 equivalent per kilo of milk. That, that's about 60% of the EU average, so it's a really low footprint in EU terms. It's about a third of the global average if you look at the FAO data. And, you know, for some of the customers that buy our product, it might be as much as seven or eight times smaller than the footprint in those local industries. So it's hugely different in terms of how we produce product. OK, and, and, and back to you, Shane, like you, get, you went through an awful lot of stuff in that video. But just one area I want to pick on is, you know, there's a new KPI we're, we're putting out there, nutrient use efficiency or nitrogen use efficiency. And through the joint programme, we're trying to reduce nitrogen usage on farms on the 11 monitor farms and spread that widely. So maybe explain to us how you are doing that or trying to do that on this farm. Yeah, like it is something we are very conscious of in the last couple of years especially, is our nitrogen use. So I suppose fundamental to that is, is we're trying to get our soil fertility at optimal levels, so our, our phosphorus and our potassium in the soils, which would be below, I suppose, where we wanted at the moment, but it's something we're working on. So like over the last couple of years, that's been built up and gradually we'll, we'll get it to where we want it to be. But I suppose our, with regards to our nitrogen, it would be, the usage would be at 240 kilos per hectare. Before that, it would have been up close to 250 kilos per hectare. And we're gradually trying to re reduce that down to below 230 kilos per hectare over the next couple of years. And that will be done by getting our soil fertility right, getting our lime right. Our lime is good on the farm, so once our pH is at optimal levels, around 6.3 for grassland, we can, um, I suppose, reduce our nitrogen use. We receive 10% of the farm every year and we incorporate clover into our receive mix and clover takes in nitrogen from the atmosphere organically so again it reduces our, our need for chemical nitrogen um, and also the trail and shoe which is low emission story spending and maybe a lot of people might be aware of what that is but it's what traditionally you would have seen a splash light out in fields where all your you can see all the slurry and the emissions are going off up into the atmosphere a lot of it's lost um, and I suppose it's not good for the farmer because you're obviously losing nutrients and it's not good for the neighbours either because it's important to keep them happy as well. There's, <laughs> there's less fumes after these trailing shoes that go straight, into, yeah, well, <laughs> go straight into the soil. So um, look, it's, it's, it's important like, you're making more better use of your organic nitrogen that way you're cutting back in your chemical nitrogen and it's good for the farmer and it's good for the environment. And Brendan, just on the nutrient use efficiency, maybe explain how that is calculated, Brendan. Just sure, so yeah. nutrient use efficiency is basically how much N are you sending out the gate of the amount of N that's used in the system. And Shane at 28% is top 10 percentile in terms of that value. And I suppose people would look at that and say, oh, 28% nutrient efficiency, does that mean we're losing a lot of nutrients yeah, from systems? that's what it sounds like. Yeah, no, it doesn't actually. I mean, I suppose what's happening there is nutrients are moving in lots of directions. So it's building organic matter in soils. Some of it is released as N2 gas, you know, which is harmless into the air and so on. And then some of it is lost. And I suppose the, the key thing is if we can match nutrient inputs to what's going out the gate and nutrient output, I suppose, in protein and milk largely, then we can achieve a good balance and have very low levels of losses. And that's exactly what's happening on this farm, you know. Okay. And like, 
Shane, from a Glambia perspective, you're selling the milk out there. The whole importance from the grass fed, how important is that from Absolutely, you? Absolutely, Richie. That's, that's one of the, the big strengths that the Irish production system has, that it is grass fed. We're, we're small family farms that are managed, the animals are managed by the owner that needs those animals as for their livelihoods. You know, we've, we've small herds, we have a grass-based production system, we have a low emissions production system. So we've got, we've got it all really, and it's just about marketing that, but we need to make sure that we, we are in that grass space uh, and, and that low emission space, which is so important from a regulatory point of view and from a customer point of view. So Shane here, just on the grass piece is at absolutely at the top end of it. So in our truly grass-fed uh, claims that we make about the 250 days of grass, Shane's at 290. We've 95% uh, call out. Shane is well north of that with the amount of grass that he's grown and utilising here on the farm because he's getting the lime right, he's getting the fertiliser right, getting the soil fertility right and then he's managing it and utilising it right through from the early part of the year, you know, good opening covers, good closing covers, making sure that there's grass there for that long period, the 290 days, 300 if he can, if the weather permits. So that's, that's really where you'll add the value. The fact that the cows are going out and feeding for themselves means we have to feed less, feed less uh, silage, feed less meals, and that's keeping the, the emissions down all the time. So in terms of supporting our farmers with this, so obviously, you know, Shane here is getting a lot of support from yourself, Richie, and, and others as well. But in terms of supporting the, 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 the full Glambia population of farmers, if you like, we have a number of initiatives there running. But one in particular is, is the Great Grass Programme, where we're looking at, you know, supporting farmers in terms of reseeding, fertiliser, lime, you know, soil testing, making sure all the basics are right, uh, measuring grass and making sure that the, the utilisation is there and maximised. So I suppose what, what all of this does when you roll it all together and particularly the grass fed and the animal welfare benefits of that, that really that allows us to go to the marketplace with a, new, a unique proposition, ticking, ticking all the boxes that are really important to consumers and that, that modern consumer who's so aware, of, particularly of the environmental piece and the animal welfare piece where grass fed just works. Okay, and, and I think I, and there's a question coming in here from the audience, but I'm just going to, Shane, to you first, like you're going to get to 290 days, that doesn't happen by accident. No, I suppose there's two, two parts to that I look at. It. First is you have to have the grass there in the first place, so is the growth and the utilisation. So the growth is, we obviously measure the grass, you see that through the video, and do a grass budget then for the autumn and for the spring as well. So we know exactly how much grass is there and we can, get the, we can ensure we have the right cover there to get the cows out as early as possible in the spring and to keep them out as long as we can in November, obviously, um, weather permitting. And the second part I said is the utilisation. So to, you have the grass there, the other thing is to actually to graze it. There's no good having it out there if you can't get to it. So we would have put in extra roadways throughout the years, and especially this year we focus on that. We have lots of gaps into paddocks, so we've, um, it gives us great flexibility as well, even for, for water as well. We've just great infrastructure to get the cows out to all the paddocks well into the year, and that's how we can get such um, up to 290 days a year out of grass. Okay, great stuff, because that's a big figure, that 290 days. Siobhan, I'll turn to you on the question. Yes, Richard, there's plenty of questions coming in and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. The first question is on soil fertility. What's the fertility status of the farm? Hmm. Yeah, so I suppose soil fertility, as I said, is something that's been built up over the last few years and it's a slow process. So most of the indexes for P would be in index 2 and then index, low, low index 3 for K. So we're targeting to get, get them up to high index 3s over the next couple of years. Um, again, like I said, the, the P especially is a slow process, so we'd be spreading compounds um, like 86.12. We would have spread 27, 2.5, over the years as well, and probably it's not as, as good, like it's probably making it a slower process. So I suppose by concentrating on 86.12 and concentrating on our, with our low emission slurry spreading, we're getting our P's and K's out and getting more value out of them. So we expect the next couple of years to be up at optimal levels then. Okay, is there another question, Siobhan, coming through? No, that's okay. So on that, we're just going to leave the... Uh, grass subject and we'll come back to that later if there's other questions or we have questions and answers if you have other questions just uh, type them in and now we're just going to move on to our next uh, section for today it's about biodiversity and how Shane has left room for nature on his farm. From the baseline assessment on the farm there was a biodiversity level of 18% on the farm which was considered high. We have a lot of features on the farm already, lots of hedgerows, we have water courses which act as corridors for nature. We also have uh, whooper swans that come in um, during the winter time in a, on the proportion of our land. We have low input pastures, uh, deciduous wood. We also have set 
some wildflower seeds as well around the, the yard to encourage bees and, and pollinators. We have more plants in place as well to increase biodiversity levels on the farm. So as part of our biodiversity management plan, we're going to set a new hedgerow land by the fence here behind me. It'll act as a corridor for lots of animals. It'll be a nesting site for birds. Um, it'll create a new habitat and it'll also reduce our field size from seven hectares down to six and a half hectares. Okay, we're back live uh, in the studio here and back to Shane. And like you've covered a lot of ground there on, on that video and, and the plan. I suppose the important thing here is this has been built into your overall plan for the farm biodiversity and it's new. It's called, mm -hmm. like you wouldn't have built this into your, into your plan before. Maybe the main points of that plan, uh, Shane, maybe. Yeah, I suppose what, like when I think of biodiversity, I, I think of the four principles of retain, maintain, create and enhance. So look, I suppose we have so much biodiversity levels on the farm already, we probably weren't even aware of, so there's been a study done and we'd have levels of 18% on the farm, which would be actually be just high even for the, the future farm group. Um, so look, I suppose we're, we're looking that way, like it's, the levels are high already, but we need to, to maintain that, like we need to keep, make sure they stay but there. There's one thing that makes it a lot higher though. Yeah, I was, I was getting to that point, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah I was the, I'll go on to that, so the, the whooper swans, the, they were the big one, like, they come in every, every, I suppose, winter, like could be there for five months. Um, one time we would have been probably trying to hunt them away into the neighbours, whereas now we're trying to round them back up and get them back in again. You love uh, them now. You love oh them. yeah, no, geez, uh, we're trying to get more, but if you, know, if you know, if, if you have any responses to Kenny, you can send them down to us <laughs> if you want. But um, there could be 70 or 80 of them there in the winter, like, and they're, you know, they're migratory birds, like they're magnificent birds to see them, like. Um, so look, I suppose, it's, it's lovely to have them in the farm. It's kind of unique to the farm, we're lucky to have Absolutely, them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I suppose, like other aspects then as well as, on the farm we already we have a low input pasture as well on the farm it's kind of it's wet land like it's it's land it's already been drained years and years ago but it's still it's still wet like and if we had to go pumping money into that and you know trying to drain it again it's going to cost us more money and for very little return so just leave that there very little fertilizer on it and um, very little pesticides used to steal some dry cows graze away and it's um it's good for an environment like you know and it's it doesn't it's not going to cost us any money so so the only things i i think with biodiversity it's all, it's simple stuff like, you know, none of this is rocket science um, and it's not going to cost a whole heap of money. Um, I suppose, uh, like another example of what we've done this year was we put in a, a bee bank, we call it, I suppose, the wildflower um, seeds. So just where we built a new shed, there was a bank along there and instead of growing weeds, we said we'd put out some, um, some seeds and like, they, they were only set in July and they're starting to come into flower already. Like they look well, like lovely, nice colourful flowers and already you can see bees around them and next year when they come into full life, like they'd be lovely to have the farm with them, like we can spread that throughout the farm then as well. Um, and I suppose another thing we're looking at in our plan then is the, is the hedgerows. Um, we'd have like, lots of hedgerows already on the farm and around the external boundaries in some parts of the farm. But I suppose one section on our main milking platform, there is a big area of around 50 acres where there is no internal hedgerow. So we're looking at setting a 450 uh, metre hedgerow just for, it'll, it'll be a shelter for cows, it'll be a corridor for, for wildlife, it'll be an extra habitat. So native species like a, a white tarn, like, you know, and it'll, it'll reduce our field size our average field size from seven hectares down to six and a half hectares on the farm. Um, so look, all this, it's, it's all little things, but I suppose, like, we do need to be kind of incentivized, I think, as well, to, to do this at the moment. Like, if you set a new hedgerow or set trees, you're not getting paid for it by through your, through your basic payment scheme. Um, so, look, at the moment, like, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do, and it's um, a step in the right direction, but I suppose for, for all, every farmer to do it, they are going to need to be incentivized, and hopefully that will come down and, the policy makers are looking at it in, in the next um, cap we'd be hoping we'd be incentivised um, mm. to do those sort of things. And just even you look at that, that way you are encouraging pollinators to, to the bear bank and then you, you set the, the flowers, it didn't cost a lot of money like boys. No, like, the, uh, like there were just there were called bee bombs that came like it was called 50 euro thing for the whole the whole autumn like and you just throw them out on the soil and they, they grew away like for the the white flowers actually the, the worse soil the better um, okay. Because otherwise, if you throw them onto good soil, the, the grass and the weeds will compete them. So um, there's, there's, there's no work in them at all, really. Like you know, and just they need a little bit of rain, and they'll, they'll take off. But and this just a bank after building the shed was just a bare bank that needed. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah, it was just it was a bare bank, and as I said, all would be there. Otherwise, would be weeds growing. And on the south facing bank, then um, I basically just cleaned all that off, and I made it a, like a, a kind of a. I suppose you call it a, a bee bank again, just for the solitary mining bees. They can burrow into the, the bank and um, they can live in there as well. So um, little simple things, but um, no, it's, it all helps. Okay. And, and uh, like you can see what's happening on the farm here and Shane, the importance of that to the wider Glambia 
um, absolutely producers. Richie and it's, it's again it's like the grass fed it's it's there's a demand now for improving biodiversity right across the world you know and the, the government of Ireland has, has identified a, a, a biodiversity emergency here as we know so we know that people want to make a difference but we're actually starting from a really good place we've got a really good level of biodiversity on our farms and for the first time with with work that's been done through this program through Chagas we have numbers on biodiversity now so as Shane was saying he's up at 18 percent but the average of the monitor farmers the, the future farmers is 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 eight percent or over eight percent so really really high in comparison to other systems where where you know you just have uh, flat fields and and no hedges no trees no anything else to to keep the 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 birds and the bees happy as well so so we're, we're in a really really good place and you know it, it, it's it's just a matter of building on that now from where we are so uh, earlier on this year as most people will know we had a we had a payment for biodiversity uh, an unconditional 0.2 cent per litre payment to it farmers can boost uh, biodiversity on their farms but as Shane was saying you know it, it doesn't cost an awful lot of money to to make a difference it's just changing how things are done so it's the way the the way the hedge is cut you know into that a shape rather than the square shape uh, letting it grow that bit higher you know only cutting every three years on the rotational system rather than trimming all the hedges back every year allows the birds to nest um, you know things like the bee bombs the, the the wildflowers very simple practices that don't have to cost the earth but they'll make a big difference in terms of moving the dial for us we're in a really good place let's do more about it we'll we'll market that, uh, you know, th there's real positives in that in the marketplace. Okay, and I see, Siobhan, there's a question. Before I go to you, Brendan, I'll just take a question, if you don't mind, Siobhan. Yes, there's a question for Shane on hedgerow management, and I suppose it's, it's an opportune time to be talking about it when we're coming into this season. Um, the question is, what conversation does Shane have with his contractor? Because contractors are hugely influential as to how hedgerows are managed, so what's the conversation he has to make sure it's done the way he wants? Yeah, look, I suppose... Like it is to something I'm conscious of maybe like mo most farmers don't cut the hedges anymore so it's up to contractors to do it and maybe they haven't the, the awareness and I suppose the training may be required for it so it's something I'm kind of personally believe that maybe there should be some sort of training course there for contractors like that they know the exact way to cut the hedge um, and I suppose as well that they can identify different species that are within the hedge like the, say a white horn native species that they can leave to mature um, so like when I'm getting the hedge cuts getting the hedge cut on a does I cut a third of the farm um, every year just to, to allow some of the, the hedges to, to mature every second or every third year so I'd be saying that whatever hedges are cut it's try and leave a dense base try and cut it in a kind of an A shape like Shane was saying um, you try and leave a bit of height on it as well because like birds they weren't they're not going to nest low in the ground because obviously predators the foxes and get them there they're not going to nest too high in the hedge because obviously they've predators from the sky so they want to be kind of in the middle of it but you just need to leave a kind of a shape because you see a lot of hedges maybe and over the years contractors are i suppose their tune their their mindset is to cut a nice box shape hedge it looks lovely for the for the neighbors again i suppose and nice and tidy looking but a box shape hedge is not good for for habitat creation so you want that a shape hedge and i think it's up to the farmer to say exactly that's the way it should be done and it's up I think that, that contractors should get some kind of training and try and try and, and, and learn what is the best way to do it for, for nature. Okay, and I think there's another question, Siobhan, that you want to... Um yeah, there's two more questions here. Are you looking into multi-species paddocks to increase biodiversity while displacing fertiliser? So mm -hmm. multi-species paddocks. And, and I might just throw that at you, Brendan, for, and then I'll get back to Shane. Brendan... Like you have a lot of, you're starting a new trial in curtains on this, maybe. Yeah. yeah, sure. It's an emerging area in terms of, I suppose, as we want to take more nutrients out of the soils and also replenish those soils better and build carbon in soils, deep rooting plants are going to play a role in that. So, you know, the plantains, the chicories, the clovers as a central plank of that is crucially important. That's already, you know, highly evident on this farm. So I suppose, yeah, it's, a, it's an emerging area and an area where we probably will be moving more in that direction in, in, in the near future, you know. And has Brendan persuaded you from the day we're down in Cortons <laughs> to grow some of this stuff? Well, I actually missed that day, actually. I wasn't you, missed there. It, you missed it. <laughs> if, if I had been there, I might have said it by now. Did you have a letter from um, me? <laughs> no, but no, some again, it's, it's something I obviously have on my radar, like, you know, We've been setting clover on the farm for the last, say, 10 years. It's always going in with the mix. Like, so we're looking at that. But I suppose there are still questions there regards pers persistency as well. Like, so I'd like to see a little bit more research done at first. But definitely over the next couple, next couple of years, I would be willing to trial it out because there's benefits there, um, obviously, for reducing your nitrogen and from a drought scenario with longer routes. So there's definitely a lot of potential there for it. Okay, and, and there's questions coming, so I'm going to take them as they're coming. Yes. Okay, how do you manage the fence by hedges when the hedge is not cut every year? So 
Yeah, so well, I suppose we're, we're lucky enough that we can graze it all. Like, so the cows, they graze all the, the grass under the fence. The fence is kept out. It's, like I say, it's, a, it's out a metre, and like, someone will probably move out to a, a metre and a half. Um, but look, we don't, we don't seem to have any issue with coming out in the fence, and it's out that bit from the, from the ditches. And once it's cut every three years, like, you know, there's not going to be a huge amount of growth on it. Mm. So, um, yeah, look, I suppose like, the years now, I got, the days I got now, I was playing ditches around them and stuff like that. That's not, that's not the way to do it. Like, so, we just we let the, the cows do the work on that, like, you know, and, and cut it every three years to keep on top of it. And back to you, Brendan, because all the research farms, and you're working closely mm. with a couple of research mm. farms, that you're all put, putting in place different plans and measures. It's exactly the same process as what Shane's talking about. So it's about knowing what you have, not just thinking about the quantity of that. We know grassland farms have, you know, 10%, and that's a high internationally. It's about then building the quality. So if there's gappy hedges or, you know, fallow areas on the farm, to take advantage of those as ways of boosting biodiversity on farm. And then it's the things like, you know, pulling out that fence, the, the metre from the, the ditches and so on. And if there's opportunity to put in new hedgerows, you know, they're fantastic in terms of putting in extra diversity. It's National Tree Day. So, you know, there's places on every farm where we can put in extra kind of you know benefits for biodiversity and we should be taking advantage of that without any loss in productivity you know so it's it's win-win absolutely absolutely okay any other questions to on that um yes we have another question here regarding biodiversity measure um is there a percentage goal to to exceed so shane has done the biodiversity score on this farm is there is there a, a target level Okay, I'd maybe throw it at Brendan first, maybe. Yeah, so I think probably looking at CAP now, it's the kind of the sense we're getting is that we're going to have to have 10% on our farms, and most of our farms are already there and growing from that. So I suppose if you're at a farm that's had a low level of biodiversity, maybe, you know, sub 10%, building that in now, I think is sensible to, be, to meet that criteria. It's going to be a bigger part of the farm to fork, and it's going to be a bigger part of the National Climate Plan. So, you know, that 10% upwards, Shane's doing fantastically well to be up at 18%. And I suppose, you know, hopefully the policy will come, become more supportive of that and that uh, farmers won't be penalised for having that extra area on their farms. That's really, really important to support the, the direction. And I think, you, Shane, you said earlier that the, the, the average for the, the, mon the future farms... Average, yeah, 8.5% 8, 8 from yeah. the work done by EFA Leader, the, the, the track of... Uh, the I think it was even higher, could have been, it was between 8 and 18%, so I think it could have been... Yeah, yeah. The, the oh, range yeah, no, is absolutely yeah. Yeah. yourself. Yeah. That shouldn't surprise mm -hmm. any of us, though, Richie, because, I mean, uh, you know, working UCD at Johnstown Castle, they both show that Irish farms, grassland farms, support much higher levels of biodiversity. If you go to mainland Europe, going to cropping farms, you're talking 2 3% biodiversity yeah. area maximum, you know. So mm -hmm. this is an easy yeah. win from a yeah. grassland perspective. We keep going back to it. It's all simple stuff. Like, it's not rocket science. Like, lots of this stuff, like, do you know, if you have kind of unproductive land or it's wet, just, just leave it to nature, just leave your native wildflower, your native plant grow, you don't even have to set anything there. Um, and stuff like moving your fence out a bit from the ditch, that's not going to cost money, it'll take a bit of time, but like, you know, it's, it's all very simple stuff, like, that's all it is, like, you know. Do, really? The other thing to say is, uh, in terms of, like, low emissions methods, protected urea, the practices that are now standard on this farm and on the future farms, I mean, those are reducing greatly the ammonia emissions on the farms, and that is beneficial, big benefit in terms of biodiversity. So, all those factors are playing in together, you know, so okay. it's... Mm -hmm. And, and, just, and just to add to it as well, I mean, all the biodiversity we're talking about here is above the ground. There's so much biodiversity Absolutely. in the soil as well. And with soil health being key for a grassland-based production system, you know, that's why we need to get the soil health right. And we have that in, in most cases. So putting measures on the, on the below the ground soil biodiversity is, is a key one for the future. Okay, as well. and, and I'd say there's going to be a lot of questions on this at the end. So thanks a lot. And we're just going to move on. And basically in the next uh, video, Shane is going to bring us through his herd of cows and how they are navigating the way in reducing carbon footprint. The type of cow on the farm is a predominantly Holstein Friesian and they're, they're high EBI and their average weight is in around 590 kilos. They have a maintenance sub-index of nine, so it's a very young herd at the moment. There's 50% are first and second lactations. The EBI of the herd at the moment is 144, and it's 211 for our young stock. We would have used a team of bulls of 15, genomically selected, with an average EBI of, of 300. 
The young stock, I suppose, are the most important animals on the farm. They are highest genetic animals. We have them weighed, and on the 1st of September, they average 180 kilos. So anything below 180 kilos are getting a kilo and a half a meal, and just to get them up to target weight, and any calves above 180 kilos are, are on no meal. We scanned the cows through the milk recording, and it was 6% empty, and it was 83% cows calved in six weeks in the spring of 2020. The herd produced 482 kilos of milk solids last year and there was 460 kilos of milk solids sold off the farm. So I suppose the plan is that we can produce 520 kilos of milk solids over the next couple of years by maturing the herd and improving the genetics in the herd. Okay, you're all very welcome back after that after that video and I think you really Shane covered a lot there again. And to, just to remind you, keep the questions coming. Siobhan has a lot of questions there. At the end we'll answer them, so just keep them coming. Okay, there was a lot of breeding on that on, on that video, but Shane, maybe just the herd health and the importance of the herd health to the whole area of sustainability. Absolutely, and, and you know, we as we know the healthiest herd and the one that's going to have cows that live for a long time and produce a lot of uh, solids over their lifetime with a low replacement rate, that's going to be the lowest uh, emissions uh, type farm. And that's exactly what we have here in Ireland. We have a cow that lives for a long time, produces a lot of milk solids, which is exactly what we're exporting, and then a low replacement rate so that we're not carrying too many young stock, which of course are not producing an output. So that's really important. In terms of, uh, in terms of you know, ensuring that we don't have blockers to the, to the, you know, we've done so much in terms of breeding really good genetics in, we've got the breeding management now up to speed so we can calve early, get that long lactation, make the use of the grass, and, and, and we have the uh, nutrition bang on as well. But to ensure that we don't have blockers, uh, diseases, deficiencies, things like that are the blockers. With, when it comes to disease control, we've lots of tools in the toolbox. We've the diagnostic services, we've got the medicines available to control and prevent those diseases. So if you take on Shane's farm here, he's been herd disease screening through the Glambia program. Very, very simple service. Bulk milk samples taken, it's tested for seven diseases. You get the results back. Color-coded system tells you what to do and, and you take action and you put the diseases in control. One of the things though that we need to keep on top of, and it, we're talking about sustainable systems here, we need medicines to keep, especially in the grass-based system, especially wormers, we need those to work for us. We need those to work for us in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 30 years' time. We need to make sure we look after those and we use them responsibly. What we know at the minute is there's anthelmintic resistance developing and it's on the rise. So we need to make sure that we don't overuse those, misuse mm. those. And so you know, Shane on the farm here has found over the last number of years no liver fluke on the farm at all. So Shane doesn't use uh, fluke treatment at the back end of the year because there's no treatment, no treatment required, there's no disease there. And so that's really important. And he got that from the report. Exactly. So I'd encourage people, and we have the vast majority of Glambia farmers now using the herd disease screen and service, getting the reports. Look at the report. If the fluke results for the last year are negative and this common autumn's result is negative, you don't need to treat for fluke. So don't, don't be using a treatment. That's an irresponsible treatment. We need those to work on other farms that have the fluke and we need those to work again in future decades. So we, we're not going to have new products. There's just not going to be any. So really important that people look after those products, look after those medicines that we need in the grass-based system. And along with that then, like the whole use of antibiotics long term, we're not going to have the same for especially a dry cow time we're not going to be able yeah. to use that widespread Again, use of antibiotics, Shane. So yeah, exactly. And, and there's different ways that antibiotics can be used. Therapeutically, to treat animals sick, never going to be a problem. Of course, we don't want to be there. We want to prevent diseases. And that's why we have vaccination. And we can tell that from the herd disease screening service. But when it comes to preventative use of antibiotics, using antibiotics to try and stop a disease that's coming in, treating an animal that's healthy, that's not on. That's not, that's not responsible and it's not going to work for the long term. We've got antibiotic resistance now very clearly. It's in hospitals, it's on farms and you know, the, the focus is on food production as well to stop that rise of, of antibiotic resistance. So with new legislation coming in in, in January 2022, less than two years away now, going to put a, an absolute stop to preventative use of antibiotics. No problem to use them for treatments, but you can't use it as a prevention. So what we're doing today and what we have been doing for decades in Ireland is we're using dry cow tubes, antibiotic tubes, on every single cow. Mm. That's not going to work in the future. Many of our cows are drying off, don't have an infection. They've low cell count, they've been low all year, don't have any infection. There's no point, no need whatsoever to throw an antibiotic into them. 
there's cows that do need it and absolutely there'll be no problem but what this new legislation is going to mean is you can't get uh, dry cow tubes for cows that have a low cell count so to be able to get dry cow tubes at all you need to prove you need to have data to show that the cow is infected how do we do that milk recording milk recording has been done here on the farm by shane every month i'd encourage people to to use milk recording at least four times a year We've got about 50 or just over 50% of herds using it at the minute, more than that in terms of animals, but there's so much more value to be got from it as well. But we'll absolutely have to have it uh, when it comes to drying off in the future. So um, in terms of picking the cows, Shane has been using uh, selective dry cow therapy here for a number of years, very successfully, really good effect. Um, in terms of picking those cows, looking at the milk recording results, any cows that have a high cell count or at any point through the year, they'll get a, a, an antibiotic tube, and, an, and he picks the antibiotic tubes by using the milk culture and sensitivity test available from Glambia as well. Identifies the bacteria that, are the, that the cow has and also the antibiotic that's going to work best to clear that infection over the dry period. So the cows that need the antibiotic get it and then a teat sealer as well. The cows that have a low cell count don't get any antibiotic, just get the teat sealer and that keeps them, that keeps them right. So I suppose in summary, Richie, in terms of lowering the, the carbon footprint, of the farm and having a sustainable system. It's about having a healthy herd that survives for a long time, low replacement rates, producing as much as possible from the cows we have, and making sure that we look after the treatments that we have, that they'll continue to work for us in the future. Great, and, and, and Shane, you're practicing this, like, you know, and this is your first year using, uh, last fall, a year ago was your first year using selective dry cow treatment, was it? No, I've done actually the last three years. Three years, yeah. Yeah, no, I've started off Right, I suppose everyone starts off gradually, just pick a small number like so. We picked everything below 100,000 of a cell count. As even actually the first year, was, I think it was below 75,000. Okay, and as you were starting off. As you're starting off, and I suppose doing it every month, you have great records then. So anything that was below 75,000 had no clinical case throughout the year. They were chosen. And I suppose we had, we've had a young herd the last few years, so it actually ended up being um, 30% actually in, in the first year. So it's, it's been 30, over 30% every year. It's 33% again um, that last got year. got no antibiotics. It's just got teas here, only no antibiotics because I suppose I wanted to be ahead of the curve. I suppose I knew this was coming down the line and I wanted to get a bit of practice in, I suppose, rather than being forced into it and then end up with big problems. So I suppose I would be encouraging people just to give it a go and a few cows. It might only be four or five cows. Just try it out and get your hygiene right because like, you do have to have everything spot on because if you're not using antibiotics and you're putting in a a teeth sealer. Um, if any bit of dirt goes into the teeth, it's going to be locked in there and, and you're going to get issues. You're going to get, you're going to get E. coli mastitis. You could lose the cow, obviously. So it's important that everyone's done surgically. Everyone has to be really take your time, do it right. And um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's worked well for us and each year we're getting, we're getting better and better at it. Okay, and just, I think there's a question coming through on that and maybe we'll take that question. Yeah, Sorry, there's a question on milk recording and it's coming in from TJ. How do we encourage more farmers to milk record? I, I'll, I'll put that to you, Shane, first maybe. Yeah, Shane. yeah, absolutely. So milk recording, it's a no-brainer. You can't manage what you don't measure. That's the measurement of the cow production. What we want to have is the cows that are most efficient in the herd and breeding from those. What we know today from milk recording results is 15% of cows are actually a drag on the profitability of the farm. They'd be better not on the farm. 15% of the herds nas uh, cows nationally are actually not leaving money behind at all. They're costing every farmer. So milk recording allows those uh, cows to be identified. Certainly we don't want to be breeding from them. We really want to get rid of them and breed from the best animals. So, so absolutely, that's the, the, the key benefit to, to milk recording as well as the requirement that's going to be there for the purchase of dry cow tubes in the future as well. Okay, and Shane, do you want to comment any further on milk recording? How do, how do we encourage more people? How are you going to encourage your discussion group? <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose... I can say what Shane was talking about, like you can see what you can't, what you don't measure, you, you can't manage, that's okay. the way I look at it because, um, like you know, at least if you know which cows are, are producing well and which ones aren't, like Shane said again, you can, you can breed off those ones and the ones that are healthy, it doesn't make sense to give them antibiotics, so you, you know exactly what each individual cow is doing without making decisions based on the whole batch, which just doesn't make sense, like you know, so it's, okay. um, it's something I definitely, I know some farmers do give it up after the milk price drops, but it is, it's one thing I would never drop anyway, is milk recording, like it's mm -hmm. so important, and, and I suppose we're one of the few farms that would do it every month. Okay, and, and the whole area, EBI, listen, is one of the technologies out there that's seen as the big area for reducing carbon footprint, and maybe explain that how, in your farm, how you've used mm -hmm. EBI. Yeah, well, we've been using EBI for a good few years, Richie, I suppose. Um, 
for the last 10, 12 years, it's, it's just been all focused on EBI. Um, we would have had a high RBI I heard previously, and that type of cow, I suppose, was a high yielding type of cow. You couldn't get them back in calf. They so used to fill the jars up with water at the time. The milk solids would be low. Um, so that, like, that wasn't sustainable. Like, you have a high turnover, high replacing rate. So I suppose the cow, we're focusing now on a, a medium-sized cow, a hardy type cow that'll go back in calf, good health, less, less trouble um, with others' feet, that kind of sort of thing. So I suppose we want a cow as well that'll, as a good feed conversion as well, that'll produce um, as much milk solids as possible off grass and that's, that's low maintenance. So at the moment, like the herd is producing 480 kilos of milk solids and you'd be hoping to, to hit 520 kilos of milk solids per cow over the next um, couple of years. Um, like it is a young herd at the moment, like we would have expanded over the last five years from 120 up to 100 cows. And I suppose like 50% of the herd will be first and second lactation. So it's a lot of room for potential there. So the plan now is we're milking children 10 cows and is to consolidate. I suppose you hear a lot of people in the, the media and the public talking about dairy expansion and, and you know, all cow numbers going up and it's bad for the environment and this and that. Like, so I suppose the folks now on farms and the future farms, and this farm in particular, I suppose, is to consolidate, is to mature the herd. We want an uh, efficient cow and that's going to, to lower our carbon footprint. Okay. Okay, and I think on the video you mentioned a bit about the heifers, the importance of the quality heifers and managing those heifers correctly. Yeah, well actually that's the key obviously there. I suppose a bit like I mentioned about young farmers earlier, that we're the future, we're the, the next generation. So it's the same for your, your, your young stock as well. Like they have to be um, obviously as high EBI as possible. Again, we're looking for the best genomic potential there. So we're breeding off our, our best cows again um, and they have to be looked after. And like we, we can't like rear our, our heifers as well. And, we want them to obviously reach their potential and, and come to the target weights for breeding and when they come into their first lactation. Um, so it's, again, it's important just to, to focus on EBI there and, and ensure that we have a, an efficient and a, a productive animal that's going to last in the herd and we can keep a replacing rate down below 20% rather than carrying um, lots of young stock and surplus when there's no need. Okay. And, and Brendan, coming in that with the EBI and other aspects as regards the cow, what else can we... Sure. Well, I was just going to add, Richie, that in terms of EBI, I mean, every time you improve EBI, you increase the productivity of individual animals, you will reduce the replacement requirements of the herd because you're getting fewer and fewer empty animals and so on. And that's one of the big benefits in terms of footprint. We talk about footprint and emissions. If you can manage with fewer replacements and a smaller young stock enterprise, that's a massive advantage, one of the main benefits of EBI. I suppose there are other things that you can do as well on farms. It's not just about breeding. Um, like if you look at, I suppose, you know, anything you do in terms of grazing management, Shane's really good at grazing management to improve the quality of swars, you lift animal performance. So anything you do that lifts animal performance from the same level of inputs or reduces your requirement for inputs, that improves your, your mm. profile. There are some really interesting things happening in terms of the other swars and so on. I think they're going to play into that in the future. Crude protein content of diets, the small amount of supplements that we do use in these systems, we know that they're, they're so good in terms of nutri nutritional value mid-season that we can actually reduce crude protein content in our diets, take some more nitrogen out of the system in the feeds we use. And, you know, I suppose the combination of all those factors together, there's lots of scope for further improvement. We believe like that if you t if, uh, with the technology we now have coming through, we could get back as low as half the European average in terms of footprint. That's possible with the, the breeding and the management traits combined. You know, it's super potential. Okay, well done. I think Declan is looking at me here. He's telling me to move on a bit. So <laughs> thanks, Declan. Listen, we're going to move on now to a video where Shane talks about the water quality in his farm and again, the plans he has put in place to improve the water quality. This part of the country, so we have very free draining soils, so we're conscious of nitrogen leaching, especially in our drier fields on the other side of the road. And we do have gently sloping fields and we have drains on the farm, so we are conscious of, of reducing our nitrogen losses on the farm and we try to keep buffer zones as well of five metres for, for slurry and also two metres for, for chemical fertiliser. Down at this end of the farm, it's more heavier soil, so we're conscious of phosphorus leaching through sediment loss. So we do try and stay further away from the, the drains during the first two weeks and the last two weeks of the closing season. So it is important for us to identify the different soil types on the farm. And so our drier soils will be more prone to nitrogen leaching and our, our heavier land is more prone to the to phosphorus loss. So we can manage our fertilizer and slurry then accordingly.
Okay, welcome back. And again, keep the, keep the questions coming. We've loads of questions coming. Um, Shane, listen, we have a joint program again. Well, both Chagas, Glambia are working on, other processors are working on this whole area of asset. Maybe, just maybe go through that. Yeah, just to so. briefly mention asset, the asset program. So it's Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Program. It's a one-on-one -on -one service that's available from a specialist trained advisor on water quality management on the farm. And really what it's all about is it's about breaking the loss pathways of nutrients, be it P, be it K, sediment losses, so that we can maximize the nutrients that are on the farm and not lose them off the farm, which of course then can have an impact on water quality. Every farm is different, no different from herd health, from the breeding, from the management on, on every farm. Every farm is different and every farm has different solutions to the problems that they have. So what the asset advisor will do is walk the farm with the farmer, identify where the risks are based on the soil type, the, the, the profile of the land, the, 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 what, what's been spread on the land and, and what uh, waterways and so on are through the, through the, through the land. Um, once, once they have seen the evidence of what's going on on the farm, they can develop a bespoke plan for that farm. And Shane has done that. Well, this, this program works in priority areas for action. So there's 90 odd uh, priority areas for action across the whole country. Shane's not actually in one of those priority areas for action, but he took the step to contact his ASAP advisor to get advice on, on in terms of his own farm. And maybe Shane will take us through that now. Yeah, Shane, maybe mm. just comment on that. You have a plan in place. You've put a plan yeah. in place to how yeah. to improve the water quality here. Yeah, like Shane mentioned that, I suppose, we, we're not in the catchment area for the ASAP program, but I suppose I wanted to be proactive about it again because we have open drains around the farm and obviously they're getting into a river somewhere, like that water's going somewhere, so we're there along the chain, it's important that we play our part as well. So, yeah, that, uh, I contacted the ASAP advisor, he came out and he, and he gave us you know, good advice and tips and I suppose the biggest one for me was is to manage our soil types. We'd have two different types of soil types on the farm, I suppose, across the road. We'd have more kind of free drain and kind of, um, I suppose, um, drier land and then this side of the road then it's more kind of a, a wetter, I suppose. You wouldn't call it a bog if people in the, the west are looking at it. It's not a bog. They wouldn't call it a bog. No. It's, 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 a, <laughs> uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit wetter, but um, that's, I suppose, in that type of soil you have more risk of phosphorus loss and sediment loss and then in, with the free draining soils it's more nitrogen is an issue. So we're looking at, at managing those, um, especially in this, the shoulders here, you know, the springtime especially, um, like with your slurry and fertiliser, you'd be trying to keep out five, even 10 metres with, with slurry if your fields are a little bit waterlogged, if they're a bit soft, you're trying to stay away from your open drains. Like, um, and like that's, that's important like, because obviously like, we, we don't want to be any fertiliser whatsoever going to the drains, so just like, keeping that extra 10 metres is not going to make a, a whole difference to us, it's only going to be a, a section of the field. But um, well, I suppose other, like, another simple thing around the yard is keeping our, our yard clean. We have an open drain around the yard. We, we purchased a road sweeper um, lately and that'll just keep the yard clean and it won't leave any kind of dirt or any kind of dirty water and get into the drain. And I suppose the new thing is with roadways too as well is to make sure there's no water getting off the roadways or dirty yeah. water getting into our drain so they're sloping off into the fields as well. Okay, very good. And Brendan, I'm going to turn to you a kind of a dirty question. I like throwing a dirty question as a tip man. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, do you believe, like we're, we're talking about a growing dairy industry mm. and yet we're looking after water quality and the environment in general. Can the two happen together? I'm really confident that they can. I suppose when you look at the science and the technology, we've been measuring water quality for quite a while and we can run these systems with very low levels of nutrient losses. There are lots of technologies there. So like agriculture is a significant pressure on water quality. We need to acknowledge that and kind of, you know, what do we do about it? You know, in the north and towards the west of the country, it's the less permeable soils and pea losses from those. So breaking those pathways, as Shane talked about, using roadways and uh, hedgerows and so on, being very conscious of water movement and sediment loss, that's going to solve a lot of those problems. In the south and to the east, you're going to be dealing with more with nutrient or nitrogen loss in, ter in terms of in increasing nitrogen concentrations. That's where the big dairy expansion has occurred, I suppose. And, that's, and in that part then, what you're looking to do is you're trying to reduce the overall nutrient loading. So, you know, more legumes in this ward, better use of protected urea and low emissions methods so that you can reduce the, the, the amount of nutrients you require to run the system. That's going to pay big be benefits in terms of reducing the nitrogen concentrations in waterways and so on. So, and look where farmers have engaged in, in programs such as ASAP to deliver this, we're already seeing the benefits. I mean, ASAP already there's a 16% improvement in water quality in the last, you know, in such a short period of time. So hugely encouraging. I suppose the reason though I'd be most confident about this, and I suppose with a 
conscious of the wider audience is like dairy farmers like Shane, you know, they've embraced the challenge, I suppose. They've solved a lot of problems that have come up in the last 20 years. You know, 20 years ago, we thought we couldn't have highly fertile cows or good milk composition. We were distinctly average Absolutely, in Europe yeah. in terms of milk composition. Today, this herd, very few empty cows. He's cruising through peak lactation with 3.5% protein. You know, it's unheard of productivity gain. At the same time, he's going to solve these problems by virtue of the new technologies that are, and embracing them fast. And one of the things with research we're always conscious of is that dairy farmers are so rapid at adopting technologies and fixing solutions. So like, even when we're doing experiments, we're worried that the farmers are actually implementing the technologies quicker than we're actually coming out with the results. So it's, I suppose it's this guy and guys like him that fill me with the confidence that we're going to meet this challenge head on. Yeah, absolutely. And the one area we haven't covered a lot today is use of protected urea. And I, Shane, I know you've used it widespread this year. Maybe just comment on the research side from the protected urea point of view. Yeah, Daniel. sure. Look, there's a good body of research there now done in Johnstown Castle and uh, in Moorpark we have ongoing studies looking at different sites, looking at protected urea. Basically, I mean, Ireland is can-based fertiliser has been the tradition here, unlike most other countries. There's lots of emissions associated with those. Moving to the protected urea, basically you can reduce those emissions. We get exactly the same dry matter production. We reduce the cost of nitrogen for the farmer, so it's, it's an economic gain for the farm, and also we, we have a major savings in, around the emissions. So it's a, it's a real good story, a real big win, and really looking forward, I mean, to see much more adoption of that by farmers over the next few years. You've used it widespread this year. All the future farms are using protected mm. urea. Yeah, we've yeah, used throughout the whole year, yeah, we use protected urea and found it great. We've grown just as much grass. Um, like it's a very efficient, it's a very safe um, type of fertilizer, so. I'm delighted with it and I'd be encouraging any farmer to, to try it out next year just to see how they get on with it. I think my, my father's delighted with it. It doesn't take him as long to spread the fertilizer now as well. As <laughs> he's, uh, he's delighted with it and he would have been slow Did to even adapt. Did he any of these nice tractors, no? No, he keeps them in the shed. He only uses <laughs> them for show. They're not allowed out. <laughs> They're not allowed out. Okay, yeah. thanks for that, Shane. And we've loads of questions coming through, so I need to, we need to get back to those. Siobhan? Okay, we have a question in from Tim. How does Shane manage runoff from the farmyard to ensure water quality? Yeah, so as, as what I did kind of mention already is that we keep the air clean, like that's, it's clean water goes into the drain, so um, by having the road sweeper, like even especially around sil when you're feeding silage in the winter, often you see if you're going around to grab a silage, it's going to fall on bits around the yard and muck off the tyres and stuff, so keep the air clean, it's only, it's clean water goes off into the drains. Yeah, and you've invested a lot of money in the yard, silage pits and putting channels in front of silage yeah. pits and slurry storage and housing, maybe just yeah. comment on that, like you've... Yeah, well, that's important as well. Like, you know, to have the obviously all the channels for the silage pits and all that. It's um like it's necessary now. I suppose slurry storage is a big thing. We had to increase our cubicle um, um capacity as well just to keep up with the number of cows. So slurry storage was another thing we solved at the same time um, in 2018. So I suppose we don't want to be in a I suppose at, at risk of having to go out in January. Say if the weather was bad in the middle of January, that we have to go out and try and get slurry out on wet ground. So. By having sufficient slurry storage above what we need, it allows us a bit of flexibility so we can maybe hold off till the, the soil conditions are, are right for it. Okay, Siobhan? Yeah, we have another question here on water quality. Has there been enough emphasis put on um, putting in buffer strips to, to maintain water quality? Okay, I'll turn to you, Brendan, on that one first. Yeah, so I suppose it's about the right solution in the right place. So where you're dealing with overland flow of nutrients, you know, from f either from a farmyard or where there's just a big, you know, I suppose a lot of, of water converging at a part of the farm. If it's overland flows to rivers and so on, buffer strips have a huge part to play in terms of, and riparian zones in general, both in terms of boosting biodiversity, but also in terms of slowing that pathway filtering out some of those nutrients and uh, reducing the, the rate at which they enter the water courses. So, yeah, like I suppose on a free draining soil then, the buffer strip, and if you, particularly if you don't have a, an open water course, I mean, a buffer strip is not going to be a, a, that much value in terms of, because it's, it's, you know, it's more leaching then becomes the problem there. So the nutrient loading, using the legumes, cutting the chemical fertilizer, those kinds of things are the ways to try and solve that problem. Yeah, but I think the question is we need to emphasize it more though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And no we're not talking play, about yeah. enough the buffer. And you were actually doing it on the farm here, Shane, aren't you? Yeah. You're, you have buffer zones. Yeah, we do, yeah. Like we'd, we'd, we, our fences, they're, they're always out uh, like a meter from the, the ditches anyway. And um, if there wasn't an open drain there and even we, like, we'll, we'll mow them out even a meter and a half where we feel it's necessary. Any place to, like through the ASAP program would have seen that there's a few risk areas where you have a little bit of a kind of a hollow where it's more prone to maybe sediment runoff for, for phosphorus especially. So 
it's about knowing your farm, knowing your soil type and, and making decisions based on that then. Okay. We have loads yeah, of questions. Yeah, we have two more general on, on, on the general theme of reducing carbon footprint. How do you measure carbon footprint? What's the target? And then there's a question here from Fern. Is it econ economically, does, sorry, does it require a large initial investment to do it? Okay, Brendan. So how do you measure it? Yeah, so how we measure it at the moment, I suppose it's based on inventories, what feeds are coming into the farm, uh, what milk is going out of the farm. We have emissions factors that are associated with all those things. And I suppose one interesting kind of new area of research is that actually uh, the more we look at these inventories and so on, the more we realise that grazing systems are different. So even this year in Chagas, there was a published study on nitrous oxide emissions from grassland are actually much lower than we thought previously, just because, you know, grazing is so much different. But it's about using those emissions factors, I suppose. That's, that's the way it's calculated for a farm. Um, uh, the second part of the question, Richie, was, sorry, I can't recall. Oh, the second the part targets. of the answer. Is there an, an investment, oh, initial investment Sorry, cost? yeah. So in initial terms of investment, yeah. No, actually, and when you look at the farms like Shane's, the top performing farms, they're more profitable and they have the lower footprint. So largely reducing the footprint and more efficient and profitable farming go hand in hand. And that's, mm. that's really why I'm so confident that, you know, we can achieve these things because it's in everyone's interest. Efficient think, cow, efficient yeah, grass. So I think one of the biggest things is is mashing your stocking rate to your, your grass growing. That's the key, like, because if you're overstocked on farms, that's going to, you're going to have a, a huge carbon footprint then. You're going to be buying in a lot of feed. So I suppose we are conscious and we grew the herd from 120 to 200 cows. I had a plan in place was to go up 20 cows a year. If we grow the grass, we keep them. If we couldn't, we wouldn't. Because, you know, if, if we do have to go and import and feed from, from outside, it's obviously going to be a, a way higher carbon footprint. So um, that, was, that was something that, we're, that we were always conscious of, is to have a plan in place. Um, okay. Yeah. Siobhan, I'm conscious yeah, of time question, now. There's a question here on urea. Why are, are protected urea? Why is urea the only protected fertilizer on the market? Brendan? Um, that's a good question. I actually don't know the yeah, answer okay. to that, to be honest. Why isn't can protected? Well, so, I mean, I suppose the urea form, I suppose it's naturally, it's where all the, resu the research has been done, I suppose, and all the product bases. Um, it's, I suppose it's the form. I urea, basically, is not, calcium ammonium nitrate losses, when, when you apply calcium ammonium nitrate to the soil, it's readily available, and there's quite fast nitrous oxide emissions from that. Uh, immediately okay so urea I suppose is a more stable form of N in the soils so that's number one but unfortunately with urea you'll have ammonia losses there'll be volatilization losses with urea so protected urea I suppose is it's moving away from the nitrous oxide the greenhouse gas emissions number one and secondly then because it's protected you don't have th those ammonia emissions mm -hmm. associated with that so that's probably l largely the main re that's the reason why we're using urea yeah Perfect. sorry We've spoken about protected urea already, but there's a question in here from Eugene. How can we encourage more farmers to use it? There is a resistance to using it still. How do we encourage more mm. farmers to use it? Okay, encouraging more farmers to use it, like the research is, there's loads of research, Brendan. Yeah, mm. it's compelling. It's absolutely compelling that, I mean, there is no difference in dry matter production. The benefits have been hugely proven for a large number of years now, you know. So mm. I suppose right. it's, for some farmers, they'll have to, they'll see Shane doing it and they'll follow his lead yeah. on that. That's so what I was going to say. I think that's yeah. the best way. Like, I say anyone in Chagas, like Lambie, always say to you, like, you can put up a, a presentation, talk away about the farmers all day, but unless you actually see it working on farm, like, it has to be peer to peer, like that's like farmers listen to other farmers and if you see it working and, and it's doing what it's supposed to do, like that's the best way, through discussion groups, um, through these sort of things I suppose are important as well, like you know, because um, yeah, farmers definitely, they, they take advice from other farmers and if they see it working in practice, they'll more likely well, to adapt 11 it. future farms are all using it and are very confident, no problem. Yeah, and they're yeah. measuring, I think the point here, they're measuring grass every week yeah. and, and they can see the grass growth with protected urea and it works perfect, yeah. I think that's, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time, Siobhan, but Okay, and there's a lot of questions there that we're not just not going to get time to get mm -hmm. to, but we did comment on the solar panels later on. Maybe it's a question to Shane. Why did you go down to the route of putting in solar panels? Yeah, well, I suppose, firstly, it's, it's the right thing to do. Like, you know, it's renewable energy. Looking at the, the big picture, like I said, we're only a small example, but, like, you know, it's doing the right thing. And I suppose it is, it's going to save us 30 to 40% in our energy bills as well. Um, look, so we've installed them three weeks ago. The installation we're all everything's gone really well so far they're up above us on the roof um, so i suppose it'll be it'll be next year we'll really see the benefits but i'd be able to to record all the to the consumption the usage on the on the app i'd be able to see that so i know exactly firsthand what it's what what the benefits are i'd be able to see all, i'll have the evidence there in front of me so there'll be no guesswork um so unlike in it should pay itself back in, in six years like so i'm 
Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how it works out and I said it's a step in the right direction. And Shane, you set up this initiative. Yeah, so, so it's farm gen that Shane has in, in, installed here on the farm and I suppose we're constantly looking at ways can, what ways can we reduce the, the, the energy consumption and the, the carbon footprint of the farm, the emissions associated with it. And you know, farms are big users, dairy farms are big users for milk cooling and for uh, water, heating. water heating and then for, for milk and process as well. You've got a big demand for energy usage and solar is a perfect fit there. We've got the roofs of the sheds available. There's always going to be a south facing aspect on, on a farm and install a small number of solar panels, not big investment, very good payback on it, real opportunity for farmers. It'll reduce the, uh, the emissions from the farm. It's, it's taking fossil fuels out of the system. It's doing our bit. It's not gonna, it's not gonna change the world in terms of mm. carbon footprint, but it's just doing our bit. And so that, that service or that product is available through Glambia, just get in touch with the local advisor. There's 100% funding available through, through FundEquip and there's uh, uh, grants available there as well. Okay, I'm going to take one final question, Siobhan. Yeah, and the final question is a quality of life question. So does she, Shane see a benefit in terms of the biodiversity and that on the farm in terms of their quality of life here on the farm? So making the effort for the environment. So you mean like, is it in our quality of life ourselves, like is it? Yeah. I suppose, yeah. What should we do? Like it's, it's something like I am, I am passionate about and I suppose I'm, obviously I'm proud to farm. I'm, I feel like I'm a custodian of the land, I suppose. Like you want to pass the farm on to the next generation in a better place than you got to yourself. So obviously by looking after the environment, that's that's the number one thing like so um, I get great satisfaction out of that like, you know, and this is only the start of it. So hopefully in whatever when I decide to retire, whatever it is, whatever 40, 40, 50 years time, who knows how long. I know it's only twenty, only 20 left. <laughs> I might be uh, I might be kicked out, might be pushed out the door, who knows? But um yeah no it's it's all about taking pride in what you do and every farmer will say that. Okay, I think that's a fantastic way to finish in <coughs> and really thanks to to you and the family for having us here today, the amount of effort you've put in in hosting this event, the mm. information. I, I, I think I've spent three or four nearly a week here in total. And, and I need a break from your Richie now for the next few days. <laughs> 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 I'll have to turn off the phone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. listen, you'd be great. And to all the family, I know they're inside in the house watching. So it's really great. And thanks, thanks for having us here today. Thanks to Brendan Horn for all that information. To Shane McElroy. Thanks to Glambia, Chagas, and the European Milk Forum for you know, organising today and been with us today. And thanks to you, the audience, uh, for participating with loads of questions. This, is, uh, this webinar is recorded, so you can go on to chagas.ie and you'll see it under Let's Talk Dairy. Um, under Let's Talk Dairy. And I suppose there is more questions that can be answered by, on social media. Do you want if there's more there? I, like, I wouldn't answer any questions later on. Okay, that, and that's an important point. So that yeah. basically Shane is taking over the social media, uh, Chagas social, the Twitter account and the Instagram account until about four o'clock, just before Milken. Yeah, I thought you were Milken this evening. I know, I will, I will <laughs> might leave that for a while, might leave that for a while. So Shane, you, you can interact with Shane for the next, until about four o'clock this evening uh, through the Chagas Twitter and Instagram account and we'll have loads of posts and ask loads of questions during the day. And again, thanks to everybody. And sorry, I should have mentioned at the start that Zoe Kavanagh, couldn't be with us today and she just sent her uh, apologies, Zoe from NDC. Thanks everybody and goodbye.